Good news, everyone. We found a magic lamp. It's surprising, I know. We each get one wish, and we're using it to grant ourselves video game sequels. In retrospect, there were probably better wishes, but here we are. As such, the members of Outside Extra and Outside Xbox have made their choices and selected five games to get sequels through the power of magical wishes. And here they are! Genie, do you have any magic left for other wishes? Oh, he's shaking his head. Oh well. The Genie has come to you, Andy. The genie wants to know what your one game is that gets a sequel. Obviously, it's Mick and Mac Global Gladiators. Where are the good McDonald's games? <laughs> they used to be everywhere in the 90s, didn't they? The genie has locked that answer in. <laughs> Unreal Engine 5. <laughs> Mick and Mac take to the streets to spread the good word of hamburgers. Um, no, OK, let's do a real one. You know what I would love a sequel to is the game Sleeping Dogs. Grand Theft Auto is all very well and good. It kinda, it's kind of it's kind of standard. Whereas Sleeping Dogs did a lot of things really well and better than Grand Theft Auto. So if you don't know Sleeping Dogs, it's a Grand Theft Auto style game, sort of open world action crime game set in Hong Kong. And you play uh, a guy called Wei Shen, who is a undercover cop who has to infiltrate the Sun On Yi triad gang. It's a very sort of hard boiled Hong Kong action plot where he gets into the gang and the police are like, you got to get us the details on the triads. And he's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll do it. But then he's, you know, he's making friends in the triads and he knows that there are people in there who aren't as bad as they seem. There are a lot of people who are as bad as they seem, don't get me wrong, but he's also got friends in there and he's, his loyalties are being pulled in all these different directions and it's just a, a nice, tight, well-told story. I mean, I don't know if you played Grand Theft Auto V, I would not describe that <laughs> as a tight story. Uh, and, or particularly well told. But yeah, the Hong Kong setting was uh, unique for the genre. It did a bunch of things really well. So the, you know, the shooting and stuff was cool. You had the sort of um, John Woo style action gunplay where you would slide over tables and shoot people in slow motion. It was based a lot around like parkour as well. When you were traveling around the city, you would be like parkouring up onto things and running around, which is again, if you've ever tried to move. And it, like, well, like a yak is a game as well. If you've ever tried to sort of get up onto a curb on a pavement, your character's like, and then you get hit by a car. Wei Shen would just do an acrobatic half flip and land on it. But yeah, for me, the, like the best thing about it was the uh, the combat, the hand-to-hand -hand combat, because it was very like kung fu movie style. It had a, a Batman Arkham style combat system where you could counter incoming blows, but it also had like environmental takedowns as well. So you could smash people's heads into like fans or um, onto like metal railings and stuff. <laughs> as you got better you would go to this little training dojo to learn more moves and then you could do like just ridiculous things like break people's legs in the middle of fights like stamp on their femur you like that you can't do that in grand theft auto it has uh, really good driving and you could like action hijack cars like you could in vin diesel's the wheel man only it was obviously a game that people played unlike vin diesel's <laughs> The Wheel Man. Brilliant performances from everyone. It's got a really good cast. Um, Emma Stone is in it. Uh, Lucy Liu is in it. Like, yeah, um, Tom Wilkinson. The guy who plays Wei Shen himself, Will Yun Lee, is excellent. He's just, he's a really relatable, likable character. Um, which again, I don't know if you've played Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> but no, it was great. It had a great sense of humor. It was really fun to play. And after it came out, again, Grand Theft Auto, it released a bunch of story DLCs that were all really fun and good. It released a um, like Enter the Dragon style one where you had to take part in a kung fu tournament on a secret island. Uh, it released one for Halloween where um, you had to fight a bunch of Chinese Jiangxi hopping vampires. It was great. It didn't take itself too seriously. You could get like a bunch of weird outfits like a Bruce Lee jumpsuit. Um, I love Sleeping Dogs and I would honestly rather have a second Sleeping Dogs than GTA 6 at this point. So Sleeping Dogs is my pick, Genie. Lock it in. And if there's any Genie magic left over, Mick and Matt Global Gladiators too. Thanks. Let me tell you about one of my core beliefs about video game reviews, and that is that you should never criticize someone who's reviewed a video game and, you know, either liked it when you disliked the game 
or disliked it when you liked the game. Because ultimately, who are you to tell someone whether they enjoyed a game or not? Their opinion is their opinion. And, you know, game reviewers have a difficult job to do, uh, which is to distill, you know, tens of hours of uh, video game down to, you know, maybe a few hundred words and, um, and explain to you why they think a game is worth your time or not. With all that said, IGN giving Alien Isolation 5.9 out of 10 is f***ing bull****. The reason I bring this up is not to have a go at IGN. They're great people, they do wonderful jobs. The problem is, is that that single review, I think, did more damage to the chances of an Alien Isolation sequel than anything else. Obviously, IGN is one of the biggest video game websites on the planet. Uh, their reviews hold a lot of sway among very many people uh, and obviously are heavily weighted in things like Metacritic and stuff like that. And the guy who reviewed Alien Isolation for IGN just kind of didn't like it very much. And, you know, some of the criticisms were somewhat valid. I, back in the ancient history of Outside Xbox, I also did an Alien Isolation review. We didn't do a lot of reviews, but I really cared about this game, so I thought I'd review it. And one of the things I criticized was the fact that it drags a bit. It has a couple of, like, bits where it looks like it's about to end, and then there's another few hours. But obviously, that is a small criticism in amongst many, many uh, celebrated things like the absolute capturing of the tone of the original Alien film, the reuse of, like, lost bits of music score from the 20th Century Fox vault, you know, the love, level of care and attention that went into Alien Isolation to create what I think is a game that really captures the, the brilliance of the very first Alien film and expands upon it in really sensible, interesting ways. You know, Sevastopol Station feels ripped from the same universe as the Nostromo. And, you know, the addition of the working Joe robots and the idea of Siegson as a, a a corporation that is competing with Wayland yutani which is the woman from the films, but is, like, worse and a bit more rubbish. What the hell happened here? All this stuff was just so beautifully integrated into the fiction. And, of course, the introduction of Amanda Ripley, you know, Ellen Ripley's daughter, who is referenced in the films, and the fleshing out of that character was so, so cool. So many amazing things. And then, obviously, the alien itself, this amazingly intelligent, uh, horror monster that uh, pursues you around the levels. And I think one of the things, the problem, I think the reviewer at IGN, and again, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but um, I do feel like the level of sustained stress of that game over the course of maybe more hours than he was anticipating having to play it for probably negatively affected the score because it is an extremely stressful game. But, oh my gosh, is it such a shame that that game did not sell enough to, to do a, to have a sequel. And I, I, you know, I do think people were turned off by those initial reviews. What a brilliant horror game. What a fantastically, tonally appropriate horror game from one of the best, you know, best horror movies of all time. And um, just everything about it is so, so good. And we're never going to see a sequel. They'll keep pumping out Aliens games forever. Probably, <laughs> yeah, of wildly varying quality. But um, is anyone ever going to make another game based on the original Alien? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, that's that's my one. That one still hurts. That one still hurts. Um, yeah, sorry about it, IGN. Don't mean to throw you under the bus, but 5.9. Come the f on. I have simply two words for everyone at home. Portal 3. Do you know the biggest lesson I learned from what you did? I discovered I had a sort of black box quick save feature. In the event of a catastrophic failure, the last two minutes of my life are preserved for analysis. I was able, well, forced really, to relive you killing me again and again forever. Recently, uh, I actually played through Portal 2 
for the first time. I was actually pretty late to these games. Like, I knew Portal, everyone knows the cake is a lie, etc. blah, 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 blah. But I, I played through uh, Portal 1 a few years ago, and then I was like, hey, I should really actually get around to playing Portal 2. Played it, absolutely love it obsessed with it and now I like millions of people around the world am desperately waiting for another installment in the Portal franchise. I what I love about these games is that they're not so complicated that you're completely stuck but they're just complicated enough that when you complete one you feel like a total genius and you just it's very like oh yes good feelings and chemicals and vibes in my brain thank you I enjoy that. I like and when you finish a Portal level like there's no way that's the real solution. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta go and you're like, I have fudged that, woo! But not only are those puzzles great and make you feel like a genius, there's also this brilliant world around it uh, with aperture science and the comedy behind it. In the first one, it was just you and GLaDOS and just having that kind of like back and forth, even though you weren't saying anything. Then in Portal 2, you had the amazing Stephen Merchant coming in and just Absolutely Wheatley, I think, is one of my favourite game characters of all time. Got an idea, but it is bloody dangerous. Here we go. Ah! Oh, for God's sake, they told me that if I ever turned this flashlight on, I would die. Valve, I don't know how you do it. I feel like the character's having a back and forth, even though I can say nothing. It's brilliant. Hey, Valve, I don't know why you don't do it anymore. I uh, exactly, and I want more of it. I played through all the co-op in Portal 2 as well. I want more co-op, please. Thank you very much. Imagine teams of like four, make it even bigger and make it more complicated. Come on, bring it, I'll do it. It just fry my brain, Valve, please. I, want, I, want. I loved also just learning about the history of the place. And I wanna learn more about Aperture Science and I, I wanna see more of that backstory. There's been a lot of like spin-offs and comics and all sorts of other things kind of going into the background of Aperture Science and uh, uh, like I, I like that those are a thing, but I want more of the first person portal there, portal there, because it's just such unique gameplay. It's just such a, you know, ingenious little game. There's always so much heart and soul and humor. This next test involves the Aperture Science Aerial Faith Plate. It was part of an initiative to investigate how well test subjects could solve problems when they were catapulted into space. Results were highly informative. They could not. I just think it's that perfect mix that just makes my brain go, yes, please, num, 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 more, more. They were teasing Easter eggs for Portal in Half-Life and mm -hmm. Half-Life in Portal. There's that icebreaker ship called the Borealis. Mm -hmm. that you, can find. you can find in Portal 2. Like, I can't like... wait for Half-Life and Portal to come together. Yeah. They just didn't. Nah, they've still got a really good reputation games wise so when everyone they say we're going to make a game everyone gets excited but they just don't make enough games anymore <laughs> the core writing team of Portal all left out though. no that's the problem is if they if they just focus on selling games that aren't theirs then they're going to lose some really funny and good people who could uh, keep that world building going you should try a portal reloaded Oh. It's a fan made Portal 3. <gasps> See, the fans making yeah. it again. They make all the Half Life so, games the new, again. The, new to the gun is uh, a time portal. A time portal, yes! <laughs> Valve, take notes. Just do that. G just give them money and let them make it. Please, I just need more. I, I made the mistake of playing Portal 2 and now I want more. <laughs> so, what's the name of this video? <laughs> you get one wish, what which game gets a sequel? Okay, you have, your powers are extremely limited, Genie. A wish to make a sequel. A single wish to make a to sequel. To make a sequel for a video game. game that I'm going back in the land. Uh -huh. you okay. <laughs> you, oh, you no, don't do any well, world hunger. Well, there aren't any other problems or... in the world, as you know. Yes, of course. Well, Genie, now that we've solved all the other problems in the world, I'm going to use my wish to wish for a game sequel, and that game is Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. <laughs> I know there was a Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 
to in development. But is it here? No. Did they tease it in 2019? Yes. Was it meant to come out in 2020? Yes. Was it delayed to 2021? Yes. Do we have it now? No. So I'm going to keep wishing for it until it bloody comes out, aren't I? Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines is one of the greatest games ever made. A cult classic, I think you'll agree. A masterpiece of atmosphere and narrative and setting and place and time. Um, it's set in uh, an, a deliciously rendered Los Angeles, different parts of Los Angeles City. And if you haven't played it, uh, there are many ways to play it these days. Um, I suggest you get on board and, and enjoy it while you can. And hopefully we'll have a sequel to it out sometime. Uh, the, the news is very scant, but I have faith that it will come at some point, especially because I've now set the genie to work on. I don't know, is the genie going to like make the sequel? No, he's going to make the developers make it. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, I mean, whatever works. If it's still set in Seattle, that's fine. I think for my money, the kind of central city hub at the heart of the experience is all important. So that sense of atmosphere and place and time, that kind of distinctive setting. Se Seattle, great. Let's go Seattle. Rainy, gloomy. Yeah, fine. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Vampires love a bit of rain and gloom and lack of sunshine. So if anything, it's probably even better than Los Angeles. Yeah, I need romanceable vampires. I need biting people. It's very, my needs are very simple and straightforward. It's not a, not, a, not a difficult game to make. Why is it taking so long? The game will be, as the previous game was built on the Vampire the Masquerade system, the tabletop roleplay game system. So obviously you'll be adapting that again. People uh, are ready to embrace vampires again after that whole Twilight unpleasantness. I mean, vampires have never been hotter, Andy. They've never gone away. You've had Twilight, you've had True Blood. There are simply not enough vampire games and I need the makers of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 to step up and be the heroes the world needs and make us more vampire games. What about that Battle Royale one? Yeah, I don't want to battle royale other vampires. I want to bite people. <laughs> Novels and stuff, right? There's, There's yeah, I've been, I've, I've been doing my damnedest to tide myself over with the text-based ones, but text can only get me so far, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I will read, but I would rather have graphics. So stop making me read and make me a video game. Stop making me imagine these hot vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Not very imaginative. <laughs> <laughs> You're all coming out kind of weird looking. <laughs> you sound serious. I'm going to need details, so I know whether to pour a Hail Mary or a Highway to Hell. If you'd have asked me five years ago, Luke, do you want a sequel to F0X? I would have said, yes, I do but I understand why I don't have one. I'll be the first to admit there's kind of, you know, a niche game and the reason that they stopped making F-Zero is that people broadly stopped buying them. However, however, that was five years ago and things are different now. The industry has moved on, the world has turned and now is exactly the time that Nintendo should make a new F-Zero X. <laughs> And I, you know, I've waited until now to make this wish of the genie because I don't want my wish to bankrupt Nintendo. I'm not out here trying to bankrupt Nintendo. I want them to thrive so they make more Animal Crossings and whatnot. And that's why I think now if they make F-Zero X and I have to make the genie forces them to do it, they could potentially make a lot of money. And the reason is, look at games like Fortnite, Fall Guys, uh, look at what they've done with Destiny, things like that. The concept of an evolving game. They should do this with F-Zero X. It's perfect for it. Make it free to play. That's fine. Give it things like seasons. Give it that thing where it's like, this week, double XP when you do death races. You would be working towards unlocking new vehicles, new customizations, things like that. I would even tolerate microtransactions because when you look at what F-Zero X is, this is this is its perfect setting now. It, now is the time and it should be done now. The appeal of F-Zero is that it is so astonishingly fast and the cars are so grippy that it's almost less like playing a racing game and more like playing one of those like endless runners. Like imagine Temple Run, you know, like the goal is basically just like lightning fast, ah, ah, of you know, trying to not crash into things. It's real, it's real twitchy and that's why no other racing game, including Wipeout, although I like Wipeout, nothing else really fills that void. Nothing else quite has the feel of F-Zero X and that feel was super, super good. The other thing 
that F0X had that has not been replicated anywhere else and that would be so perfect for an online evolving game now is this extremely over the top and weird cast of characters. There are 30 races in F0X. So again, with, you know, big online games. Battle Royale, online death race mode with other real players. Constantly shrinking track space. It would be a lot of fun, you know, alongside regular race modes and Grand Prix and, 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 all, and all, all, all that kind of jazz. Gates that come down after a certain number of players have gone through. Damn, that, yeah, that's good. Nintendo should be so lucky as to have a genie force them to make this game. <laughs> uh, people are familiar with Captain Falcon because they put him in Smash Brothers and stuff, but there's, there's all these other characters and it's basically, uh, the closest thing I can think of is like pro wrestling. There are all these very, very weird and bizarre characters with these elaborate backstories. F-Zero X2, when it comes out, will have seasons and storylines that involve, you know, you'll log on to the game one day and it'll be like, uh-oh, Black Bull has been tinkering in the mainframe and has now you can only race on these two tracks this week. And it'll be like, oh, you've got to help everyone else fill up this big meter that's in the sky. And when we have enough energy, then Captain Falcon will be able to deal the killing blow. You know, like Fortnite does, and it's fun, and it's cool, and there could be concerts in it. It would be great. Now, some naysayers will also be saying that they actually already did make some more F-Zero games after F-Zero X, and they did. There was, uh, for example, F-Zero GX on the GameCube, and the questionably named F-Zero Climax, which only came out in Japan. In it came out on DVD. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a Game Boy Advance game that only came out in Japan. The problem with those games was that the vibe was off. F-Zero GX, it didn't feel quite right. F-Zero X was exactly right. They got it all exactly right in that. The feel, the vibe, the music, and they just need to basically bring that back as a, a free-to-play evolving game. Nintendo will make a lot of money. I'll be very happy. So really, let's cut, you know, like kind of let's get this thing going. Let's get this rolling. If you need me to like put some stuff, just throw some stuff at a whiteboard. I'm here. So those were the games that we demand one sequel for. Thank you, the genie, for sorting all those out. Although I guess, is the genie doing all of them or picking the genie's favorite? If it's only three wishes, does that mean only three get chosen? Yeah, the three best ones. And we meant to only wish for two sequels and then free the genie. We forgot to free the genie. Can we ask for a million more wishes? It's too late now. <laughs> we've used them all and we're two wishes in credit. We owe the genie two wishes. Now we've got to do the now we've got to do the genie's garden. Oh, you hope you hope it's gardening. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. Here are some more you can watch if you like. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, and if you would like to go the optional extra mile in supporting the work we do, then you can go to patreon.com slash oxclub and join our, the, the OX supporters club. There's a cool discord. You can chat. Uh, you can make your own wishes. Thanks for watching.